Jojo. Good morning. <laughs> get back. Well, Jojo was a, I saw get back. <laughs> We're live, everybody. We're here. Good morning. It is the top, top of the morning to you. Where's my coffee? Ah, I left my coffee mug. It's oh, production. Uh, you got yours. How I'm having dare drama you? today. Great show. Miranda, we have a great show today. Don't know where Corey is, but who cares? Got a great guy coming on. I Hits. know. I'm so excited. I got, I got my notes right over here. So if you guys don't think I'm into something good, Mrs. Brown, you got a lovely daughter. Henry I'm the Henry the Eighth. I am. You said it before I did. Kind of hush all over the world. Great song. Great year it came out. 67, the year I was born. Huh? You like that, Miranda? You know who our guest is today? It's Peter Noon. Peter Noon. That's right. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Noon of Herman's Hermits. But, but sometimes they call him Peter No One. But you know what? Enough of the chit chat. Let the chaos begin now. It's coffee talk with the tea All right. Good morning. Good morning, everybody there. Really quick, our guest coming up right now, Peter Noon, right there. Look at him. He looks fantastic, and look at me. I look like like Santa Claus over here. But <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome him to the show. Stop the chit-chat. Mr. Peter Noon. Peter, welcome, buddy. Good morning. Oh, what a lovely day it is. Adika live, and look at the fine Miranda there, and I'm... I'm uh... I had a hang gliding accent, accent. I was hang gliding and I landed on the 405 and it was busy. He was, you know, always busy, the 405, as you know. So um, I'm feeling pretty fresh this morning. Oh, my this, God. Fresh. Oh, my Man God. Man sawing wood. Now, wait a second. Peter, jumping out of a plane? Is that what you're What are you doing? What is this? Are you jumping out of a plane? I don't know about hang gliding. No, I'm, no, I'm, hang gliding. You yeah, what is it? I don't, I don't know human how you kite. It's a human kite. I don't know. That. It's just something to, something to do when you feel like if, if you miss Keith Moon a little yeah. bit, yeah. You, you get go hang gliding or go on a ride at, at like Space Mountain. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. I, I came to go hiking on Runyon Canyon. I crawled down on my butt down the hill. I'm afraid of heights. How do you? Well, it just it just depends how you, how you feel about yourself. You know, I mean, yeah. if you feel pretty fragile. You mm -hmm. look pretty fragile. So, you know, if you're feeling pretty I, yeah. fragile, <laughs> you probably should stay in bed. I am pretty fragile. Let me tell you something about me. Dress British, think Yiddish. I'm always promoting. So that's what that's that's my model today. Oh, there you go. Promotion. There, there you go. You know, you got to promote, baby. So, Peter, you, I'm so glad that you're here. A mutual friend who I reached out to get you here. Um, but let's start, man, with, with your host, with everybody that doesn't know Peter, you're living under a rock. The guy is a complete legend, yeah. and you haven't aged one bit. I want to know, first of all, because Miranda is married to a, a, a great doctor in the Central Coast, but you, what's the secret? You, you look great. What are you doing? You know, I think I've had a pretty luck-filled, luck-loaded life. So, you know, I think, you know, I think a lot of people get stressed out by things, but I'm a bit Panglossian. You know, I, I, I'm naively optimistic about everything. So, yeah. you know, if, if you're naive, you know, the, I love people who say things like, I don't know. Because, you know, now no one says that anymore. But I don't know. You know, nobody I says I don't know. They say, what do you think of this? Oh, no, 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 no. They all get all shitty on each other and everything. Yeah. I go, and people ask me what I think. I said, I don't know. I don't know. So I managed to wake up every morning and go to bed every night, ethically, completely comfortable, that I didn't do any harm to anybody yeah. in the world, and I haven't said the wrong thing to anything. I don't like your hat. And um, <laughs> you know, I'm sending you one. <laughs> I just get it. You know, I think that's it. My parents were a little bit like that. My mother mm. was like this, this fun alcoholic lady who, and her mother was as well. You know, they hid sherry, which seemed to be the drink. I think sherry all sherry. over the place. And and they, they were always laughing and singing. I grew up in this house where, um, you know, uh, I think the the heritage was probably Irish. You know, both grandparents, all the grandparents were Irish. If you know what I mean. So, so we were probably Irish, pretending to be English. And, um, you know, if somebody died or there was a christening or a baptism or a wedding, everyone would go into this room called the parlor. 
and you know there were some sad songs and everything and there was a but there's a lot of great music my dad played the trombone and his brother lawrence played the trumpet and uh, they were in a band with huey gibb who was the Bee Gees dad and oh, wow. um, my auntie mary my auntie mary could play fat swallow which was a bit of a you know so sometime during the funeral thing fat swallow my very good friend the milkman said everyone would laugh and then you went irish eyes are smiling and everything and there was always music yeah. And uh, and my grandfather was the was the organ player. Can you play? Yeah, organ player, organist at the church, you know. And he could play with his feet as well, you know. Those big, you know, like uh, like uh, mm -hmm. like what's his name, Felix Cavalieri. He was like yeah. an Irish version of Felix Cavalieri. He could play, you know, all those great chords with the feet and everything, wow. you know, like all those suspensions. And and my grandmother was was the choir mistress. So there was this sort of musical world that just went around and, and oh, by the way, there was no TV, you know, there was no TV. And I know there was like a monopoly set mm. somewhere that like on, when Uncle Alan or somebody came who was a bit serious, they'd get the monopoly out and everyone would get a go at that. But the only entertainment was kind of each other, really. You know, we would talk to each other and, you know, my crap, obviously, my, but everybody would, Everybody worked in those days. It was, it was a different world, you know, and, and my parents were at work. They were actually at university and I lived with my grandparents and they got up in the morning and they went to work and I went to school. So there was not much, there wasn't any daytime socialism, socializing. You'd go to, you'd go to school and that's, that would be your life until school finished. And then you'd have some friends that you'd see until six o'clock and then, uh, then you go home and there was a, yo. And, and I remember there was this big old, I'm sure a lot of people from my will remember this. There was a radio in the kitchen, a big fat old radio with like knobs on the front and really like historical looking. And uh, and that was on and there'd be the news, you know, at nine o'clock at night, there'd be the news. And at the end of the news, everyone would go to bed. And um, and in the morning you'd get up and that, that news would be on. And then after the news, they would play music and it BBC had no option. There was only one radio station. So, and the BBC, you would hear what they played. So you would hear 30 minutes a day of popular music, which would be anything from the sound of music to, to, to uh, Del Shannon would, would be yeah. popular music. And then there'd be classical music, which would be those pretty pompous English things, you know, a bit of opera, you know, no Elizabeth Schwarzkopf because she dated a nazi you know so there's all that stuff was going on in my world and it, but it was all about music yeah. and um you know and, I, and those were all the things that i brought with me into my world and they they were all even the sad stuff has happy things about it you know because music is a is this amazing stir up it stirs up memories and 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 you know, there's a there's a thing, there's like muscle memory. You know, you can you can remember the feeling of playing mm -hmm. that note and thing, and your body remembers it, and you go for it, and you go for it, and you go for it, and and and, and so so all my life I've had this sort of musical thing, and 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 when I'm when I go to work, I relive the stu sometimes the studio. You know, I, I, like I got this song called "I'm Into Something Good," and I yeah. remember we. When we recorded it, we, we were little. We were really. We thought we were pretty cool because we'd been out on the road for a couple of years, so we sort of knew everything. You know, we'd been in fights and won a few and lost a few, and we'd earned enough money to eat, so we were a real, you know, a real band. And um, we got in the studio in, in in London, and it's quite amazing, really. We did a concert in Berwick upon Tweed, which is the farthest part of England from London that you can get. And we had this driver called Ray Perrin, who's still alive, who drove, pick, picked me up at my grandmother's on a, like on a Monday morning at, at five o'clock. We drove to Berwick-upon-Tweed, which was like 12 hours. We did a concert and then we we all used to load the van ourselves. We, it was raining. I was the lead singer, but I still had to load the van. The so lead singer loaded loading the van. The van. And we drove overnight to London and we drove to this place. We found the, the recording studio. It was in in the basement of a bank in this in the part of london called bank and 
we, we drove the van into the underground parking lot and we found the door and the, the animals came out of the door. And we knew them because it's just all England is a small place, even though Berwick on Tweed is far. All everybody who was in a group knew each other, sort of, or knew who they were, when they were recording, what they were doing, where did you play, who stole what from who, and who's going to fire Chaz and all that <laughs> stuff. It was all part of the, the whole thing. Yeah. So they're coming out. They don't offer to help us carry our gear in because they're carrying their gear out. And, uh, and I remember uh, hearing for the first time Chaz Chandler saying, Mickey, where's the money? Mickey, where's the money? And uh, we go, I wonder what's all that about? Because we, we don't even think about money. We think about making a record. We just make it a record. We don't care about money. We've got money from being in a band. And um, so we go in and we, we were kids and we set up our gear and we look at each other. And <laughs> Mickey Mouse says, like, well, what have you got? What have you got, Ed? And I go, well, you got this great song. It's called Your Hand in Your Hand in Mine. He goes, oh, yeah, what else have you got? <laughs> Which was like next. So I said, well, we, we, you know, you sent us this demo for I'm Into Something Good. We've worked it out. And he goes, yeah. And I said, so I say the magic words. I think I'm probably just 16. I'm just 16, but I feel like 41. You know, I've been around so long in the music business. And I say, we're trying to go for like, I still can't believe I actually said it. We're trying to go for like a surf sound. <laughs> you know, thinking that would impress him that I knew what a surf sound was. And a surf sound basically was like uh, English pop music. <laughs> so so we go, yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we have a bash it and he goes, mm, you're not getting a surf sound. I says, hang on a second. I know this guy, I know this guy, Roger Webb. Who was a jazz player? He's a jazz piano player, and he has the Roger Webb Trio, which is pretty. Fa we all know him because he's been on the BBC in the morning when we're sitting with our grandparents. So, oh, Roger Webb, yeah, and he comes in and he goes, ah, yeah, he knows what I'm talking about. This is the first first person that I've met for a, in my whole life. And when you say I'm looking for the surf sound, man, he goes, oh yeah, so and he goes, da 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 da. -da. Which is just like a counter feel to, you know, that boom, 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 that every drummer was playing since Ringo. The Be My and Baby like, and all that other stuff, all that good stuff too. Yes. Yeah. So we get going and and, it, and, it, uh, and we find, we get a surf sound and we make the record and we, we cut the, the, actual, the actual track in one go, you know, like with the lead vocal on it. And then Mickey, Mickey says, so he mixes it all down onto, he mixes the two tracks down to one track, which is scary. He's got the drums and the lead vocal and everything all on one track. Now we've got another track. So we go in and I double the vocal. We do it again. We squash it down to one track again. Remember, there was only mono at the time. Only mono radio existed in our world. I think we'd seen a Neil Sedaka RCA stereo record in a store. I can't even play that. So... So we, we, we and then we then we put the then I do the background vocals with the guys who now we got triple everything the original vocal the overtrack and then me and the guys me and Carl and Keith singing the background vocals and you know what we were smiling and, and having a great time and believing the words you know woke up this morning feeling fine you know it was like because Mickey Most's thing was that he. he I don't believe you. He'd worked with a lot of soul singer Rick Burden. You know, I don't hear you knock upon my door. And you know when Eric sang that, that he, you, that girl didn't hear him knocking on the door. You know, I don't hear you loving anymore. You know, it's all that song. So we're in there. Woke up this morning. I don't believe you. Okay, let's try it again. Woke up this morning. You know, so we we get it done and it is a great joyous occasion and, and, and I can still see the room, and 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 when I sing it, I go back into that thing, and it, and it isn't a song about girls, a song about that recording, and and I relive the recording session while I'm on stage, and I and I kind of look forward to that, yeah. and that's what Panglossian means. There's a definition of it, you know, that I, I'm so optimistic about being able to refine all that stuff. You know, people say, oh, I like the olden days. Everything's the olden days for me. All yeah. the good things that happened to me have happened before now. 
that's all before olden days. So I'm looking forward to the next new thing to happen so I can relive that again. And and that's that's it. I don't know what the question was. You know, I do go off on I'm sorry, <laughs> really just I, you know what I'm getting I'm getting lost just listening to you because it, it, it it's just wonderful hearing your story. So I don't even care what the question is. So you could just cut me off and don't even listen to what I'm saying. Just ramble on. I'm just intrigued by it because Henry the Eighth, Mrs. Brown's got a lovely daughter. You're talking into this, and 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 now when you still sing those songs, what you just said makes sense because I I watch clips. Everything is on YouTube too. You could watch old clips of Peter Noon with the Hermits playing to to now playing, and it's the same guy. You're 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 not even ch- you know it's the same guy. You you could tell when you're you're still that guy yeah, yeah, singing. You know, you know what I mean? That makes yeah. sense. You know, yeah. somebody somebody once said you know like. I kind of remember lots of stuff, and but I can't remember who said it. But somebody said that sometimes you hear a record on the radio, and you can see the person's face when you hear the record. Mm-hmm. I got lots. I mean, if you hear Elvis Presley, you can see Elvis Presley, and hopefully you see him when he was a young man and really happening. Yeah. And uh, people people have told me that you know when they hear my records, they see me. They may see me on the Ed Sullivan Show. They may see me on a YouTube video. They may see me now. So, you know, they, they they see, it's good to have a voice that people can see. You know, like I, I think of like the grassroots. I got a lot of gra- records. It's a record. Mm-hmm. They're great. They're LP. Oh, great. And, and you don't see a face when you hear the record. I don't. You know, and I know Warren Etner, who was in the band and all that. I know them. But I don't see his face when I hear the record. And the same from, there's many groups like that. Luckily in Herman Hermits, when you hear a Herman Hermits song, hopefully people see him at the front, you know, doing all that shtick. And, and I didn't even know it was shtick at the time, you know. I, I wasn't aware of the word shtick. But, <laughs> but we, we began, we were Pete Novak and the Heartbeats. No, first we were the Cyclones, and in the Cyclones it was it was a great learning curve because in the Cyclones I was the second lead guitarist. Everybody was copying the Shadows. There was like a lead guitar player, and then there was another lead guitar player who didn't do much. Maybe strummed. Right. So, so I was that other guitar player. And one day the the really good guitar player said to the band. Sit of the in the band said to me, Peter, why don't you be the lead singer? <laughs> which, which was basically a nice way of saying, we don't, <laughs> you're not a good enough guitar player to be in the band, so maybe you can be the lead singer, which wasn't the best position in those days. Lead guitar was the guy. So he, he talked me out of being a guitar player. I put it down. I never played it again, except, you know, for fun. And, and sometimes on stage, but never on a record. Yeah. So I became the lead singer. Then we became Pete Novak and the Heartbeats. And the only way you could work in those days was to be different from everybody else. Every group did the same songs. Every You could walk into a group in a or uh, lots of youth clubs. Then they'd do Fortune Teller, Roll Over Beethoven, mm-hmm. uh, Hog for Your Baby, I'm a Hog for Your Baby, I can't get enough of your love. And, and so we... The only way you could work was to not do songs like everyone else. So we went fishing for odd songs, only to find out that every other band in the world was also fishing for other songs. Like the Searchers were, they had, their set list was like 100 unusual songs. Everybody discounts the Searchers, but if you listen to their records, they had five lead singers. They had five different they had they could do the coasters they could do the the folky stuff they could do the ballad they had a massive amount of we could only do buddy holly um so we we, we got to the cavern and there the cavern bob Wooler wow. liked us and he was the booking person at the cavern so we'd get to play there three times a day which nobody got three times a day because we'd get the lunch time where girls came and had a, a bushy a sandwich and, and listen to music i don't know what what inspired them to do that but they would go to the cavern and then you know, and watch groups and we were herman and the hermits and then we would play the the junior cavern nobody talks about junior cavern but there was this junior cavern from about five o'clock maybe four five o'clock till seven o'clock 
where, where there was no booze and, you know, no one even even thought about drugs because everyone was there trying to pick up some chick and take her around the back. So there was no, so there was that. And then there was the evening sessions where, you know, where the heavier, more mature sounding groups played. But we managed to weasel our way into that. You know, it was like, it would be the Undertakers and Herman and the Hermits. Now the Undertakers was like this massive powerhouse band that were just, I mean, they were in, they were intense. You know, you for little boys like me, I often wonder why, how, why I didn't quit, because I knew we would never ever be as good as that. So, and then then we'd come up. Okay, then, 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 then. So we had to do these odd songs like "My Boy Lollipop." By the way, no other British group was doing "My Boy Lollipop" at the time, and we didn't even think that that might be odd. You know, "My Boy Lollipop." You get my heart go giddy up. And the audience would dig it because it was a hit record and, yeah. you know, it was fun that this person, nothing sexual about it at all. It was this guy who could sing like the girl, Millie. And then we do mother-in-law because we do Ernie Cado mother-in-law because we thought, I thought that it was a cute idea, a 14-year-old boy having a mother-in-law. But yeah. the audience never <laughs> thought about the words, you know. And I made up words. I made up the words to suit my version of what a mother-in-law is. So, and we we built this sort of. And but guess what we got by working after a couple of years of that, we got a reputation, and people thought, and and also that <clears throat> during that period, everybody in the band had a job. You know, had good jobs and making lots of money doing other things. Made more money than we did in the band, but some of us were smart. And and I figured I was I was in this TV series and I was getting money from it, and I thought if I buy a really posh van, people will think we're much better than we are, and let and let's get like matching Vox amplifiers. We can use my dad's credit. I know how to sign his name. We can go to Barrett's in Manchester, and I even know Adrian Barrett there, and he he'll say take this home and let your dad sign it. And we'll go and we'll take exactly the right amount of time that it would take for me to go home and say, Dad, Dad, please sign this thing. And we'd hang out in the wimpy bar across the street looking at all that, and then we'd go back and get the credit. And at the time, it was it was, it was, was a death wish, really, you know, mm -hmm. because if I had have ever been found out by my dad that I'd signed up for like a thousand pounds worth of credit, he would definitely have thrown me out the window. It was only the second floor, but still, he would have thrown me out the window. <laughs> and there was um, <clears throat> there's a lot of stuff that happened during that period that gave us what we needed, which was a reputation. They said they're nice boys. We were always known as, oh, they're nice lads. They show up on time. They're clean. They're, 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 all those things. Sort of like sort of like um, Biden said about Obama. Oh, he's very <laughs> clean, and you know, blah, 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 blah. and that was Herman's hermits. We didn't know that that would make us <clears throat> make us uh, different from all the other from from all every, everybody else wanted to be like this. We wanted to be like Buddy Holly and the Crickets. You know, we'd sort of pick the wrong way to go. And yeah. th there were these there were these bands who were in more bluesy. Uh, and I remember we we do we do we do some blues songs because we didn't really know that they were blues songs you know we we do that. i went down to st james infirmary you know which is a real blues song you know to see my baby's there um, and i would sing it as herman you know because i would make that song mine and i i, I tell the stories if i went down to st james infirmary so so we 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 chop we we weren't doing blues songs we didn't have a bl a bluesy kind of outfit we were more suits and ties and, you know, uh, does your mother know you're out kind of boys. And um, it, it, it turned into something that that was really playable. And, and, and at some point of the thing, this is a bit of a confession here, until Herman's Hermits made it, made it, I didn't own one record by an English person. I, I knew that they were copycats, and I go, you know, there's nothing original here. 
late, later on, I discovered Cliff Richard when I was 50 years old. Absolutely. And I realized that all his songs are part of my life. So, and, they, and I, was with, I was in the songs in my world, but I didn't buy the records. I only bought American records. So when we were on stage, um, what happened was, because I was only buying American records, when I would do, when I, sometimes when I'd sing them, I'd do my really cockamamie American accent, which is really, you know, John Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's the only American accent I can do. Or, or, or carry that Judy Judy Judy. You know, you know, just not really good American accent. So, so I decided that some part of the thing that I would do these songs, but I would be, I'd be me in the songs. I'd be me in the songs, not this American person. And, and, and it was kind of an, an, a, a weird thing because as I became me in the songs, I, Herman is Peter Nooney's Herman. I, I got songs like Mrs. Brown, you've got a lovely daughter. And I sang it to Mrs. Brown as me. And that was, it was kind of a first thing. And, and everyone, what, what the bloody hell is he doing? And I just get into it. It was kind of a bit, this sounds pompous, but it was a bit Stanislavski-esque. Mm. You know, I I'd, 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 um, I'd, I'd found my way to get into the song because I, with the realisation that all my life I'd been in the songs with my screenplay. When I heard Up on the Roof, I'd never been up on the roof. I'd never been in New York. How do I know what it's like on a roof under the boardwalk? What's under the, what's a boardwalk? So I'd, been, I'd created the scene for myself all my life on every song. When I, I'm the kind of guy who likes to walk around. Okay. Dion, yeah. When Dion yeah. sang that, he was walking around Manchester and it was raining. What was, what was your vision in, in your head what, when you were doing the covers of the American music? Because I love the doo-wop. I love the drift. There's all that great stuff. What was your the vision when you were singing this? What were you thinking? You were, were, you, you were not thinking New York. You were thinking just England. Exactly. I, I, made, I rewrote the, the scene that it was the taking scene. place in. Wow. wow. Like Mother-in-law. You know, that's Ernie K. Doe, you know, the worst person I know, mother. I had to invent a mother-in-law. And she great. was a woman who lived down the street whose daughter I fancied. You know, and I thought, so I, I would go, well, if I ever I got married to her, if she'd ever even let me, if she'd even get in my car, uh, then I would sing to a mother. Like, so, so you, you'd, you'd open up and the and door, I sing to the mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I never, I, I knew nothing about America. It's All great. I knew about America is what I'd seen in movies, and yeah. and you, you know, we all imagined English people that a bit of West Side Story was going on in America. You know what I mean? Uh, and and it's like I would buy these records. Like I was a big Jackie Wilson fan, a big Sam Cooke fan, and I am. I had no idea how their lives were because I'd never never been to America. So I imagined everything to be different. Uh, and, and it was quite, it's quite, I was talking about it this morning, actually, because my daughter has a radio show on, on Sirius XM on Sundays. And what channel? she was asking me, she asked me questions about the music and how it relates. And we got talking about Little Anthony and the Imperials. And you know what, Little Anthony Imperials, they they taught me everything I know about America. They were the first pe people I met in America because we were put on a bus, 42 people on a bus, and it was Little Anthony the Imperials. I can see the turn of the I can turn. And I hung out with them because they they were boys. They were boys who'd been suddenly had a hit record and thrown into the real world. And they were, you know, Clarence and Henry, they were they were very kind to us. You know, they took they showed us like we found out a lot of stuff that we we would never have known. I mean, what's Jelly Roll? You know what I mean? You don't want to know what Jelly Roll is, but if you're 15, 16 years old, you can do that and live. That's great. You know, your story is is our other co-host, who's like me. We're we 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 love the British invasion, huge, and and we grew up in New York. So here I'm a guy from Brooklyn, he's a guy from Long Island, but we both fantasize what it'd be like to go back in time, what it'd be like the, the whole scene, the whole the, just everything, the whole British invasion. You guys 
being rivals with each other, whatever you want to call it. You know, you got the animals, you got the beetle, you got Jerry and the pacemakers, uh, Rory, the, Rory Storm and the Hurricanes, just all that stuff. And I've always, yeah. when I went to England a couple of years ago, I, w- I would walk around the streets and this happened here, this happened here, and the change. I want to bring him up because he's, he's a Peter Noonan impersonator. Ladies and gentlemen, Corey Leventon. Corey, welcome to the show. <laughs> Good morning. That's no. funny. I Hi, Corey. Hey, Peter. Peter Noonan impersonator. Yes. No, I... No, I've 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 actually impersonated Davy Jones before and Sonny Bono. Those are the only two. I see Sonny. Oh, those yeah. are Sonny. You, you look a little bit like Davy Jones when he was alive. <laughs> <laughs> Peter uh, Peter has a a funny story about uh, when he asked the Beatles to to write a hit for him. Yeah. Uh, just like they had for uh, Billy J. Kramer and the Stones. And why don't you Why don't you take it away? I love that story. I love that story too. It, My story. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I think I it's your story. Them, my question was, why haven't they written a song for me? When every, even the bloody marmalade got to do a Beatles song, go bloody, oh blah, that would have been better by Herman's Hermit. So I'm, all along I'm wondering why they didn't write a song for me. And then one day I see the, before 24 track, they have little four track boxes. I've got one somewhere, a little four track box with f- for noon written on it. And I got all excited, but then I found out that it was for no one. <laughs> it was for no. That's great. You were at you were at Abbey, and if I'm correct, you were at Abbey Road Studios, which is the legendary studio, Abbey Road. And is that correct, Peter? Yeah, it's all it's good reminiscences because you know Abbey Road Studio. I I was there so much, and I saw them so often, and they were so mean to me. There was this amazing thing about in the British Invasion. There was this enormous camaraderie it does not exist in any of maybe at cbgb's in new york for seven minutes there was camaraderie but in england there was this enormous amount of camaraderie it might be that all our dads and everything had been soldiers or something or plumbers so it was like a union of people we were like a trade union and we were all musicians and we looked out for each other and we all knew what everyone was doing even when they were doing things wrong and so there was this amazing camaraderie uh, and Abbey Road, you know, I, I got loads of Abbey Road stories. What, my, my favorite one was years. I used to go in, I have the track sheets and, the, and I got the, I, I know people who can go and find stuff that is useful for me. So they went and they got the, the, the booking sheet for, for Abbey Road for the whole, for years and years and years. And they took pictures of them, you know, it's like sort of like Korean spying. And, and, and there's one great one, which is it's like one is Herman's Hermits and then it's Paul McCartney, but it isn't Paul McCartney. He's doing Mary Hopkin. And I, and I walked, I went in the studio and it's, and it's, it's John Lennon and the other, but it isn't John Lennon, Elephant's Memory. And then the other one, this guy called Edgar Braun and, and you look at the track sheet and you can remember the day. Uh, and I was, I was this kid who just I had no fear of, I was always afraid, but I didn't, sh- I showed fear by being cheeky chappy, you know, Hey, what's going on? I'll get this round all that stuff. So, so I'm, I come through the door and there's John Lennon and I go, <laughs> what do you say? You know, he's like this famous guy. I've seen him hundreds of times, but I never know what to say. You know, hello. So, he just looks at uh, uh, My name was Hermit. He never called me anything. Hello, Hermit. <laughs> and I go, so what are, you, what are you lads doing? And he goes, recording. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's going to like, go, oh, we're recording. I've written two new songs. And he, no, 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 just recording. <laughs> <laughs> so... He was always like that. He was pretty he was a fun guy with me. I liked him because he, he he could take the camaraderie was just pretty. So he only tolerated me, and I was pretty intolerable because I was in a band. You know, I was another musician on his way to. He, he bought me a drink once. We went to the ad lib, uh, and he had this preposterous uh, Rolls Royce with flowers and psychedelic. And I liked, I loved, as you probably know, I love to take the piss out of people. And, and so I said, oh, that's nice and inconspicuous. 
<laughs> the Beatles, it's hiding from the public. They're not going, oh, you know, they're going in shops like that. He drives up in this psychedelic Rolls Royce. So and on another time, so he, he kind of like appreciated the fact that somebody other than the press said something schneid to him. So yeah, another time, so we once I see I knew Terry Doran who was his driver from Liverpool. I knew him from you don't know how you know people, but you just always knew. So I knew Terry Doran, and and Terry Doran. I see Terry Doran walking into this club called the Ad Lib, and it's got a doorway and, and a lift that goes second, third floor. I don't know. I didn't push the button, so. So I see Terry Doran getting out of this car and walking in, and then so I, I, by accidentally, exactly the same time as them. So now, even though I'm not old enough to get in this place, by about four years, you know what I mean? <laughs> not allowed in. Because I'm with a Beatle, nobody questions it. I'm not even with him. I'm just standing next to it <laughs> with Terry Doran, I'll tell you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's a great picture of them. We get in and, and I'm I, I'm not with them, but everybody thinks I'm with them. So they take us to the booth, you know, to booth <laughs> sit there. And the music's really loud. And I'm just standing there not knowing what to do. And, the, and John Lennon says, last one to sit down is an egg. And I don't even know what that means, but I sat down because I knew I wasn't an egg. So I sat down there and I... I don't know what to do. I've never been in a nightclub like this. It's more more posh than I've ever been in in my life. And a waitress comes over, uh, you know, all, and she goes, she looks at me. <laughs> when I was 17, I looked, you know, 11. And I dressed 11 as well. You know, I had everything the 11 year old boys wore on. So she, she looks at me and she goes, she doesn't not, don't want to say, are you 18? or are you 21 or whatever it is? So she looks at me, she goes, there's a two drink minimum. Meaning you probably <laughs> can't afford, you probably can't afford to drink in here. There's a two drink minimum. So from nowhere, John says, I'll have two Bacardis and he'll have two Cokes. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> and she brings the two Bacardis and gives them to him and the two Cokes to me all. <laughs> and John switches the drinks over, and we cheers. <laughs> now we're drinking, friends. Never discuss music with any never, huh? From the Beatles, just never. I think, I think he he liked. You know, he was sort of a free man. All the other Beatles were dating these um, models and doctors' daughters and actresses and posh, posh. I, I I was like a free spirit and out and about. And I think he enjoyed that kind of companionship. Somebody who didn't, even though he did have a wife at home, I think he was pretending. You know how yeah. guys so can sometimes pretend they're not married for 12 minutes? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, you know, yeah. So he was he was out and about. And, and that was basically our relationship was always, you know, I'd say rude things to him because <laughs> because you could. <laughs> you, know, and I go, you go, that's a nice suit, Hermit. Do they make it in your size? Oh, <laughs> sure. Can you show that photo again? It looks like your bar mitzvah photo. Oh, that photo. You want to see that photo? Of, of, yeah, check it out. Look, I mean, it's, a, it's a great picture. Look at that. <laughs> McCartney funny. and Lennon. It's yeah, a great he, photograph. So, so, uh, so when he said that you, there's a nice suit, do they make it in your size? I go, yeah. And the, our tailor, you know, meaning the groups, our tailor can make collars. Oh. Which was a great comeback line, and I should have probably, in, in retrospect, if I if he said that's a great suit, Hermit, do they make it in your size? I should have said, probably. That that's would have funny. been funny. That is funny. Not I want, Now, did you guys ever, in the, since you're in the Abbey Road, did you ever jam together with Lennon? Did you ever? No, any, I never nothing. jammed with anybody. Never, Me and nobody. Huh? Burden with pals, and he, he used to say. You never jam. No, I don't. I don't. That jam. wasn't your thing, right? The jam? jam. I don't jam. I jam at home when I'm when I've got a guitar, but I I don't like to jam in front of the public because I think that probably ninety nine percent of my stuff is shinola. Yeah. And if you if you're jamming, you get caught. I've had a, I've had a couple of jams with Tom Jones who, who jams on a sixpence. You say, "How's your voice, Tom?" <laughs> you know, oh, really? Wherever you go, he, he oh, that's bad. So I, I once did a Jerry Lee Lewis song with him because we both, we are both 
uh, Jerry Lee Lewis's biggest fans in the world. Yeah. It, me, Tom and Tom and I changed places, but Tom in the in like the sixties, we we were staying in in the City Square in New York, and Tom shows up at the hotel with a copy of a record from Jerry Lee Lewis called Herman the Hermit. Jerry recorded a song called Herman the Hermit. And uh, so he's he's very jealous. And, and so I went and I said, and Tom, last time I saw him, when I, last time I saw him, I, I finished the story. So, so I, w- I went to see Jerry Lee, Lee Lewis and I got on stage and sang Herman the Hermit with Jerry Lee Lewis in Saratoga in, in Florida. And you know what? Neither of us knew the words. <laughs> <laughs> but he didn't know he didn't know the words. That was just one of the songs he didn't know the words to. But me and Tom sometimes do, you know, some Jerry Lee Lewis at parties and things like that. So that's the only jamming I do. And then I get up and I sing, I'm into something. See, everybody thinks that all I ever recorded was I'm into something good and there's a kind of hush, which, it, which would have been a good start. But I continued. You, you, uh-huh. know, you continued. Kind of a hush was, is another great little story over there because you did that in '67. But then you have a Carpenter story that you were showing the chords. Is this what's the story on that? Yeah, if you can, can you believe? That's what crazy. So, so you know, we did the show in Germany, and by then I'd, I'd done this. I'd, I'd got a new a solo single, with, uh, which had David Bowie playing piano on it, and it, and it was um, uh, the reason David Bowie played piano on it is because we wanted to record the song and he was the only mm. person who could play it because it was in mm. F sharp. Uh, I don't know if it, one of the, one of David's very few idiosyncrasies was that he, could, he would only play the black notes on the piano. And uh, uh, so it was in F sharp because it plays really well in F sharp. So he was on the record. So when it came to doing it live, it was really, really tough, really tough to play especially for me, because I'm not really a piano player, but neither was David Bowie. So I, I'm learning how to play, play it and everything. And we've got to do it live on this German show. So I'm doing, oh, you pretty thing. And then I do a bit of There's a Kind of Hush. And while I'm doing There's a Kind of Hush with, with the Hermits, you know, it's very easy to play on the piano, There's a Kind of Hush. Uh, but um, Richard Carpenter, Carpenter says, ooh, the piano's out of tune. I go, who are you? You know, kind of, no, it's not. It's bloody Germany. They would never have something out of tune. Never. This this piano is like the most expensive piano that I've ever touched. And it's like, and he, go, and he sits down and he goes, and he goes, what's that? And I say, yeah, look, and I'm playing there's a kind of, what's that? I said, well, it's our new single, look, there's a kind of, show over the world. And they go, oh, what's that called? Oh, yeah, uh, well, it's, it's weird, you see, because it goes from C to E major. And, oh, yeah, see, and we forget about the piano being out of tune. But the piano is out of tune for the track because we're in A440 and the German piano is in A444. And he's such a great music. You know, he's got, he's got um, concert pitch. I've just got constant pitch. And um, he could tell that the piano was out of tune, a bit of a genius and a lovely guy. And because, see, instantly, because he was in a band, we accepted whatever he had. I used to hang out with Jack Bruce, who was, um, you know, this Jack Bruce was always around. He was, ever since I began in the business, Jack Bruce was always around. He was in this band, he was in this van. He was, see, the vans on the M1, when they built the M1, the vans with the most lipstick on them and names and everything on them. They were the most famous bands. But what we realized as we started getting lipstick to put on our vans was it was just the bands who'd been around the longest that had got, you know, they'd only got one a day, maybe. They didn't get 400 a night like we were thinking. Yeah. So we'd see, and Jack remembers that, you know, Herman Summits had this very sort of nice boy image. So, so, we'd unscrewed the, the, the legs off my mother's coffee table. There was four legs. I'm going to try and show, demonstrate the four legs screwed on the bottom of this table. Like that, 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 that. And we decided that so nobody could beat us up, we would put one of these legs up the sleeve of our jackets when we would stop for petrol or, you know, a cup of tea and a dirty old biscuit on the, on the 
because they were all in a place called transport cafes and there was no camaraderie between transport cafe truck drivers and uh, girly boys like Herman's Hermits. I mean, I, I often say, you know, we would walk in there with the tight trousers, the Cuban heel boots and the ruffled shirts and the hair down to here. I wanted to beat myself up out of it so disgraceful. <laughs> So, so we would go in there and we had to ham and, and Jack saw us taking care of business one night and it was it was me. I was thick I was I was always the people think I'm small, but I was bigger than everybody because English people are short. So I was a bit bigger than everyone else. And I was explaining to this other guy who was in our band at the time, he was Norman. Norm no Norman. You have to hit them. You have to hit them quick. <laughs> you can't wait around for because if if they get that it's called a dobber dobber if they get that dobber they will hit you with it and then they'll hit me with it so you hit him first with jack's watching who's these people who do they think they are they're gonna get killed so he tells this story so i'm in the cromwell club, club cromwellian club in london <laughs> ginger baker I'm, i don't know how i got in there i'm 16 i'm in this nightclub which is a gentleman's kind of nice club. it's got a croupier and the whole thing and it's a gambling place but I think all pop stars suddenly had moved up a level and were accepted by lords and ladies. So I'm in this place and I'm, I, I, I said, could I put two pounds on the middle 12, please? And Ginger Baker comes in my face like this. <laughs> and his face looked a bit like mine does now, all pox and horrible. He was horrible. So I put down my money. I'm going, I'm going to kick your ass. Oh, yeah. I'm going to kill And Jack goes, Peter, Peter. No, no. Yeah, I'm going to kiss you. And you kick, you kick his ass. I'm going to beat the shit out of him. He's a... He goes, no, he's a, he'll kill you. I don't think so. He'll kill you. I'm telling you, Peter, don't go outside. He'll, he'll kill you. He'll kill you. Oh, Okay. <laughs> So I don't go outside and kick years later. I'm walking down Lexington Avenue. And he was, you know, that time Peter, you know, that time Peter when you said you were going to kick Ginger Baker's ass. That was great. That was great. I said, yeah, you said he'd kill me. He said, I meant it. I meant it. And not, he wasn't going to beat you up. He would kill you. <laughs> so he saved my life. Oh, yeah, because we were talking about another life saving. During the British invasion, there were all these unbelievably unbelievably great bands who just one part of the puzzle see i say i'm lucky oh stop it <laughs> there's one part of the part of the puzzle missing it's like the mojos there was this great band from liverpool they made it they got one hit record by mickey most and then they sort of fell about maybe the manager or the agent who knows but there were loads of these great great bands like alan bounce that we'd been going around and the, the steam engine or something, something like that which was which was this great band, band. And one night, <laughs> this leader of this band, I can't tell you his name because it's murder, I think. Um, so but according to Jack Bruce, you killed him, Peter. You <laughs> killed him. I never killed him. I didn't, he came. So I had this big posh house in Denham and people used to visit. It's a big, you know, an estate really. And people used to drive and visit. And, you know, there was a lot going on and it, I didn't know half the people who showed up, but one night this guy shows up with his wife, who's an American girl, dressed as a witch. You know, she's got the hat and the green thing and everything. It's not Halloween. We don't even have Halloween in it. She was like a witch from California. You know, probably lived up that hill there where all the witches lived. And uh, so they're standing there and they're talking about, oh, yeah, yeah Peter, she's a, she's a <laughs> real witch. She's a, she's a, so I bet, I, I, said, I bet she can stop traffic. I mean, you walk along the road here dressed like that, all the cars will stop. You know, that's magic. <laughs> making fun of the fact that she thinks she's a witch. <laughs> so I said, I'll tell you what, Graham. Oh, it's Graham Bond. I'll tell you what, Graham. If she can stop a train, I'll believe her. He went, not, not that night. He waited a few days before they went to try and stop a train. And of course, the train hit them in Denham and they were found in Marlebone High Street. You know, it was a fast train wow. they stood in front of. Never had a chance of stopping. 
my so god. So you ki- Peter, you kill Wow. Wow, Graham that's Bond. a that, that's a crazy oh, But the story about Graham Bond is the band was phenomenal. It was the greatest band you ever seen. The Alan Bounce set. It was the greatest band you've ever seen. There's no way that they can't make it. How about the pretty things? They had everything right. The pretty things were the okay, you got the stones and the pretty things. The stones go wah and the pretty things go. They had everything. They had a great singer, they had a great guitar player, a great drummer. Viv Prince, a great drummer. I was always friends with the drummers in these bands. I don't know why, because I, I wasn't friends with my drummer. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> but, uh, speaking of, of, of other drummers, and any good, great band, The Who, and there's a great photograph that I, I took off of your site over here, because you guys got to check it out. Look at this picture of Peter right there in the side over there, <laughs> looking yeah. at The Who. When we speak of drummers, you got Keith Moon, you know, but look at the picture. You, do you guys see Peter right back on the side of the stage? What hey, was that the high numbers? Or, or no, that's the they, Who. Was we, the, we, the who yet. Okay. we loved them. We were good friends with them. We loved the Who. We, we, they were the most likely to succeed. I think it, it, in Herman Summit's history, because of this camaraderie thing, we every tour we would do, we would bring a band with us. Because you say you can play to 500,000 people in 50 days. And the label will get a bit excited, you know, because you can do the radio and that. So we brought the Hollies and the Animals and the Who and, the, you know, like, we always brought somebody with us that we liked. And uh, what, when the Who began the tour, they were a top 40 act. And people don't understand when I say that, but they were looking for top 40 records, hits. And I think, I think they, I don't know whether they're pictures of Lily or Happy Jack, but they were definitely... There's, there's always that bit where they go there's a, in every who's got record records got a bit of, let moon have a go of now okay let's all so, so so they came on the tour and and it was very odd because they would do barbara and the the beach boys record the beach boys record version of the record ba, 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 which keith moon would sing i think that's what he's singing there that we look, came to look at but every night we would look at them because you see all that gear on the stage. That's our gear. And we oh, that's your gear, right? Is that, that yours? Wow. In the program, it says Herman's Hermits Love Fender. And we would, they would give us as many amplifiers as we want. And they would, some, one, every night we would watch as they would destroy the amplifiers that we'd been given. And our deal was then we'll give you 500 pounds a night plus all the gear you can smash. So that as they realized that 500 pounds wasn't a great offer, they decided to smash more amplifiers to get even with us. <laughs> and uh, it was pretty funny really, because every night they would, they would take all that stuff out. And some, sometimes it wasn't completely broken. There were bits and we, they had a guy and we had two guys, Ray and Norman, who could sort of piece things, you know, you knock an amp over, there's a there's a front from another one from the night before that will go back on the front where they that uh, so we only used about in 50 days we only went through 39 amps you know it's really funny if, if you, a lot of symbols if you saved any of those completely smashed totally. amps they would fetch like 50 grand each now this was from you know one night in 65 this is from 67 and they, yeah. they would totally <laughs> yeah, some people some people buy those those P, P, uh, towns and broken guitars. Yeah, and I rudely said, you know, to somebody, um, uh, they had one in their office, this big posh office in New York, and I saw the guitar and they said, "That's Pete Pete Townsend's guitar." I said, "Ah, oh, that's nice. That's the closest you're ever going to get to being in a band." Yeah, that's it. They didn't like got... they didn't like me before, but they like. <laughs> that's that's great. You got over closest here. Closest you um... get to rock and roll. Man, you're right, Sorry. Corey, on that one. Right there, Ed Stasey and producer, a buddy of our <laughs> show. Peter, any cool stories about Mickey Most? Now, Ed Stasey produced uh, Ramones, Living Color, uh, Jeff Healy, great great friend. Hey, Ed, good to see you over here. Any cool stories about Mickey Most in the studio? Which Mickey was your, a good dear friend of yours, best friend, correct? Well, it's, it's, hard, to, it's hard for me to have much input on Mickey Most because he was my friend. He was my best man at my wedding. He was my daughter's godfather. Oh. He was a lifetime friend. The thing that I liked about Mickey was that he he was he liked pop music. 
he liked pop music and he wasn't embarrassed to say, you know, like frequently we'd come with a song that we thought was pretty good. We go, uh, listen, Mickey did it. And uh, they go, next. I go, Jesus Christ, Mickey, I've, I've not even finished the intro. It's boring. Next. You know, you have to get to him straight away. And that's, that's, we made records for the radio. Mickey most never thought about selling a record. The trick was to get it on the radio because as you all know, if you've got a record and it doesn't get on the radio, you, only your mum's going to know about it and your friends want a free copy. So they want mm -hmm. he knew that. He'd had a career a bit. Of the, and and I, when I was when I was about, I, I talked to his son Calvin a lot about it because I've got very, very good memories of Mickey. And once I went to, he was living at his father-in-law's house. You know, in, in your career, sometimes you're not doing so. So, so sometimes you're not doing so well. So you, so we're at Mickey Most's how father's step, uh, father-in-law's house. Mister Fusco, his name was Italian guy from Africa, South Africa. So, so we we sit in there, and we start talking about the Evely brothers. And Mickey Most was fancied himself, without me knowing it, to be another version of Phil Everly, but he didn't have a don. Do you know what I mean? So he was half of the Everly Brothers. So he was kind of stuck with that. So we're talking about the Everly Brothers because I know everything about the Everly Brothers because I'm a bigger fan of it than, than him. And and I know even who played on the records and nonsense like that. It seemed at the time like nonsense, but now is all relevant. And I go, and he goes, well, you know, me and Chris, which is his wife, we used to do a show in Africa where... We'd ride around on a motorcycle with a guitar and we'd show up and we'd acoustically play Everly Brothers songs and make money. We made money. So I said, oh, what do you... He said, oh, we did Walk Right Back. Oh, we did... And then... And then... And then... And I oh, and we did Devoted to You. And him and his missus sat there. I can, I'm back in the room right now. They sat there in those room. I'll never hurt you, I'll never lie, I'll never be untrue. And I was, I, I, that's, that, that, Mickey, that, what, that's it, whatever it is, that's it. Do you know what I mean? Devoted to you, he sang it to his wife, looking at her face and they sang the words to each other. And uh, through the years our love will grow like a river. That's it, Mickey. That's it. And we record stuff like that. So in the studio, he would often say, I don't believe you. Most of the time, uh, visually, Mickey would show up. He didn't say hello or whatever. He'd just come in like a producer. He's the producer. He sits in there. But he wasn't an engineer, you see, and he wasn't really a producer. He was more like an, a director. If it was in the movie business, they wouldn't have called him producer. Producer is the person who gets the money and all that. Mm -hmm. so he, he was the director, and he'd come and he'd have his cigarettes, the ones that killed him. He'd mm -hmm. have his cigarettes and this gold Calibri lighter, which having one of those meant you're a big shot, man. You are a big shot. You've got a Calibri lighter. <laughs> oh, my God. And he had the American cigarettes of Calibri. And he'd him, put his feet up. And he'd go, like, what have you got? And you'd give him a shot. And he'd go, I don't believe any of that. I don't believe it at all. So, And it came to the point where he was often right not to believe it because we'd throw stuff away. And in retrospect, we had huge balls to even take it to the studio yeah. but now it came to the bit where i i leave i'm from i'm from manchester my parents don't live in manchester what happened my parents it's not divorce or anything my parents managed to get back into the war had broken up their their education so they go to university and I, me and my sister move in with my grandmother. My grandmother lives in Manchester. Now my parents live in Edinburgh, Cambridge, and sometimes in Liverpool. So they're living in Liverpool. My band's in Manchester and my, all my jobs are in Manchester. I have a job selling old programs at Old Trafford Football Ground, newspapers, window cleaning with Alan Wrigley, the bass player. We're doing everything to make money to feed this band. 
So as soon as I make it, I don't know if you know much about grandmothers, but living with your grandmother, there's, there's good things and bad things. The good thing is they're usually deaf. And at nine o'clock, they're always asleep. So you can sneak birds in there and you can have the drummer do a drum solo uh, 2 a.m. in the morning and they don't wake up and come down and say, what the bloody hell's going down? What's going on down here? So we, we could have parties in their house. But then it came to the point where I thought all the, all the real action is in London. That's where the Beatles buy their shoes. That's where Elvis Presley would visit if he came to England. And that's where... So I, move, I get this horrible little flat in a muse house, you know, muse, up above a, an old stable, which is now somebody's got a car parked in there. And I live in London. So, but now I'm available for mm. anything that's going on. And I do mean anything. So one morning, it's like really early for me, you know, it's probably 1130. So the phone rings and, and Mickey says, Sam Cook's dead. Oh, yeah. Mm. So I go, oh, bloody hell. He said, get over to the studio right now. Eric's here, and we're doing a tribute to Sam Cooke. You know, it's 11.30 in the morning. I'm not that fresh at 11.30. I'm not even fresh now, and I've been up for three hours. But 11.30 in the morning, I'm not fresh. But I think I get, I go out, and I, and I get in a taxi, and I go there. And there's Eric Burden doing Bring It On Home To Me with Chaz. Chandler doing the worst Lou Rawls sound in years. You, yeah! <laughs> What's that? So that's the tribute to to Sam Cooke. Where's my money? Where's my money? <laughs> so I go, I go, so, hey Mickey, you know, I, I should do Cupid because you know, I can, you know that noise on the record, that I can, I can do that. I could learn. I don't know if there's what mushrooms had been around, but me thinking that doing a, a oh, leave us alone, please. We're doing an interview. So, so I just wait it out. It's okay. It's okay. It's funny. It's an old people's home calling me, Casa Dorinda. <laughs> I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready. Very good. So. <laughs> Sorry, you said to your name. <laughs> <laughs> just... No message. Landline oh. still exists. I love it. Peter's old school. So, so, I, so, you get, so I, I go, I can do the sound. He said, hey, you go, Peter. Peter. Don't know much about history. What does that sound like? Uh, is that Wonderful World? Yeah. Don't know much about trigonometry. He goes, I go, yeah, 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 and I sound cool. What about this? Who does that sound like? <laughs> who does that sound like? Someone who doesn't know anything about history or triggered on. That's you, Peter Newman. That's you getting there and singing. Jimmy Page. Jimmy Page is in there. He'll show you how it goes. Oh. So I go in the studio. There's no hermits. And now I've got Jimmy Page and Bobby. Bobby, uh, Bobby uh, all, all new people that have there. In a key that I can't sing it in. But Jimmy Page is going to show me how to do it. And Jimmy, Jimmy comes up with his bit. He goes, look, it's boring. It's boring. Let's, let's cut. First of all, let's cut the introduction in half. Like, what do you mean cut the intro in half? You just, cut the, just, you just stay over there and sing when I tell you to. Just cut the intro in half. Instead of going, bam, 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 bam. We'll just do it once. And then you will start to see. Don't know much about history. Well, I'm, I'm fully in. I'm all, I got it, I got it. I'm like, come on, I can, where's one? You know, so I'm ready to go. But the drummer doesn't hear any of this. He doesn't hear any of this. But the record is made because we, we have a 12, the animals have gone a little bit over. And we only got 11 minutes left on the clock. So the one take is the take. Mickey said, what? that's it. We're out of here. That's a tribute to Sam Cooke. I go, wait a second, Mickey, there's mistakes all over it. He said, 
that's the beauty of the moment, Peter. <laughs> it's the moment we recorded that moment. Uh, that's a real tribute. Okay, Mickey. Okay. <laughs> that's yeah. rock and roll. That's rock and roll, baby. Those are mistakes <laughs> all over. It's great because you can hear Bobby, the, the drummer, when he figures out where everyone is. <laughs> I listen to it all the time. I go, you know, it is part of the magic, the fact that the drummer is going, brum, 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 brum. oh, here we go. And he gets into it there. Those, those are the happy accidents. Those are, sometimes those are the best. The mistakes make the make it. Yeah. And really, really it's do. got a happy accident in it because it isn't the verse, you know, it's the chorus. Oh, really? Really? But but what we, what we we it's a big band thing, you know, like do, wackadoo, wackadoo, wackadoo. It's a mm. space, gives you a space. So the right amount of space. So the band leaders would use all that stuff. So so the way we did it from the way when we were recording, we didn't go letter A and, let you know, so letter A was the verse, you know, and now we're going to repeat that verse, except it was the chorus, you know, the, the but you go, second chorus, chorus, or chorus, does it have any words that you could say there? So I said, so, and it's just, and Mickey left it in, Mickey left it on the tape. It, it, it's, you know, that track, and, and that's like pre-punk rock, Henry VIII, when you really think of the accent and, and just the attitude, it really is. Well, I it, think, you know, I hate to say this because we did, we were clean cut and things, but I think Herman Summers were pretty punkish in the in that yes. we didn't in that we didn't have a plan. Even, yeah. even the Sex Pistols had a plan, which was make lots of money, being yeah. rude, you know, or truthful or whatever, you, whatever you whatever you want to decide. It's not a political thing. We'll make, so and Herman Summers, we only we only wanted to get on the radio. That was once we got on the radio. That was the end of our plan. Now what were we going to do? Let's make another song that gets on the radio. Let's make a song that gets on American radio. Let's let's get an LP that stays in the charts for two years. You know, whatever. You know, it was always next. And then we got in Dicky Bows. You know, we got to the point where we became old timers before our time. So we all showed up in Dicky Bows and did a show for the Queen Mom, where we sang "If I Was a Rich Man." And oh, that's great. That's great. Awesome. Yeah. That, Unfortunately, that's all on YouTube, too. That is. I mean, I I, I was a rich man with the accent and everything. I love it. The Yiddish accent. You know, Peter, this this today's a wonderful episode. Before, when you first came on there, I was like your story with you with the Beatles. And I was afraid to say anything to you. I'm like, hey, Peter. Hi, I'm Steph. And I was all nervous. You're going to shut. All right. Well, how long we got here? And I know you're a busy man. I want to keep up all your time. But I want to just ask you 105 more questions before we get out of here. Totally. Go for it. We got, we got two I just more want hours. To thank you. I want to thank you for being here. Thank you, everybody in the chat. I want to ask you something before I bring a secret I got a big fan. He has to ask you a question. We're going to bring him up here in a, in a, in a second. But um, did Keith Richards ever babysit you? What is his story? The babies? What is the story? Well, not baby. You know, we knew them because because we were a band. So we'd done hundreds of TV shows with them. I'd been for, once. I got a ride in their car back to to, to London because I my band lived in Manchester and I was too young to drive. So I would be. I've been stuck in in. Birmingham. So I would have this line. I, I go up to the stones. I knew Brian quite well. So I said, what are, you, what are you lads doing after the show? And th then other stones would go, we're going back to London, meaning get lost, basically. A nice way of saying get lost. So, but I was, didn't hear get lost at all. I said, can I come with you? And they would let <laughs> me go in the car and Andrew Oldham and then, and then we'd drive back to London. Wow. So I became sort of more than, more than just another guy in a band. So, so what happened was that... Um, and, and Andrew Oldham was running us as well. Andrew Oldham had the Stones and Herman's Hermits under his uh, prowess. I, he was a, I think he was a genius. At the time, every idea he had. And we were the clean-cut boys of rock and roll, and they were the naughty boys, even though I think we were probably naughtier than them. But So we, we were this clean-cut band. And so, so we get to New York, and I used to, in those days... I used to drink more than more than I could. Now I, nowadays I only drink as much as I can, but then I would drink yours as well. And um, so I'm a bit pissed, drunk, a bit, only a bit. So, and I'm sitting. You know, all drunks do it. You get leave the party, and go and stand, go and sit in that uh, upstairs to, at the hotel 
thing where you can't get back in the door locks when you go out. So I'm sitting out there and they, Andrew Oldham and, and Keith Richards comes up to me and I'm in this stairwell in the back of the hotel. And um, Keith says, hey, if we ever find out you've been doing drugs, I'm going to find you and I'm going to beat the shit out of you. Oh, hey. <laughs> that is funny Keith Richards saying that over there, that, huh? It's funny Keith Richards saying that to anybody. Well, you know, you see, nice, like, nice people. What One thing that always gets forgotten about the Beatles and the Stones yeah. and Elvis, they were really nice people. You, you've hardly ever, if you hear some, somebody saying something bad about them, it's either about they shouldn't have said burn the Bible, whatever. It's never... There's no bad stories about them. They never harmed anybody, any of them, any of them. You could say, a girl could say, well, Mick Jagger harmed me because he dumped me at the bus stop and it was raining. But not much more than that that you can find on them. Seriously, the Stones were really nice people, all of them. Yeah. I, I, saw, I, saw, I saw Charlie. I go and see the Stones a lot. Ronnie, Ronnie Wood in his book, uh, said a nice thing about me because because when they were in, when he was in the birds the birds birds when they came to manchester i helped them unload their gear and i was already a big star but i saw this little band you know how that camaraderie amongst bands is i said oh gee you will never get that pa through that door we played here a million times you can't and i helped them get their gear in and he remembers that so charlie i said to charlie yeah hey my daughter Natalie, she's got a, a really, you know, she's doing pretty good. But you know what's really incredible? The sixties for those girls. I mean, you know, she she knows everything. It's like she knows all the Stones' names, and you know that's odd because probably she doesn't know all the names of all the people in uh, Nirvana. And it, and I go, and she knows your name, and she loves. She's she's like a fan of you, Charlie. You know, because you. Cause you you know, your Mr. Yeah. Stiffy Arms thing, then that thing that you do and all that, you know, and that, having fun with him. And he goes, so I said, oh, sorry, Charlie, I'm talking a lot about, how's your daughter doing? He says, oh, Peter, my daughter's 59. <laughs> 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 and you know, and all hail to Charlie. See, have been married to the same lady. Yeah. For, must be 60 something years now since, you know, the Stones began. Think about that, huh? Think That's about that. That's pretty great. He's a pretty it's, great. That is pretty great. I hope, he, I hope there's another tour left in in him. It was there, you know without him. I hope there's another tour left. There's in no Charlie. stones without him. He just he he is the backbeat of that band. It's just I don't think it you know I don't just his touch the way he, it's Charlie Watts. It's like it's it's even like a Ringo drummer. He has his old because Ringo's lefty. Even his mistakes when he hits, it's just yeah. it's like it's just you. It's a hard thing to. Here's something uh, that it's you know it's just it's a tough one to. I've heard the replace. songs without him, and it, he's the he's the piece. I think it's like the Beatles without Ringo wasn't the Beatles. You know, what I mean, you, you you heard them when when it was kind of a little bit loose, sort of a bit Herman's Hermits with Pete Pete playing the drums. There it was all a bit. The same with the Searchers. They they were missing a drummer. And then yeah. you go, well, what is it? What, great drummers like the Procol Harum drummer. If they'd have had a drummer that that played, the fi made fields for them, yeah, they would have still been around. They would still be the biggest band. They would be the biggest band in the world. They they would have eaten the Genesis out of the game because, they, but they never had the Genesis got the best drummer the, of the, the lot. I think. Yeah, the, and sir, of sir, the who got. The, the who with the who this that's a rhythm section even though when they had kenny jones the, the, keith moon and john entwistle was a that's a hard rhythm section to ever beat they was just so in, with the who you yeah, know it was, it was uh, well keith, keith played you know if, the, the drumming that keith played was in line with the vocals he he didn't just do a backbeat he he just played along with the vocals it was very unique nobody else at the time did anything like that well uh, everybody yeah i know but every symphonic music needed something to settle it down i think that's all that's all i think so yeah so my point of view but you know if you think you if you think of all the great bands I, and i i go fleetwood mac mick fleetwood yeah, and mick it's fleetwood. always there's always a duo there the who was nothing without john entwistle nothing yeah, nothing 
he, he's most of the records are written around his parts. The songs wow. were written for him to play. What an incredible you know, bass hardly, player, if man. If you listen to I can't explain, there's not much going on apart from John. And if you listen to Substitute, there's hardly anything going on. The same with my generation. All the pop records they made at the beginning, there's a lot of John Entwistle. He's like there's the a, lead guitar player. Like the first use of a bass player, really, who led the band. That's true. Now, now, did you notice Did you that Henry the Ramones nicked the second verse, same as the first from Henry VIII for their song Judy is a Punk? Did you know that, Peter? Yeah, I, I saw it. I, I like the Ramones. I thought they were good. That was a good, fun band. Now they, I, were, they I'm, took it serious. They did. They did. I got two guests here that are coming up. They're big, big fans. Probably got questions. I'm going to bring them both up here at the same time. We got the fabulous Mitch Weissman right Mitch! here. Mitch Weissman, believe <laughs> in backstage. Good morning. Hi, boss. You know, good morning, Mitch. Good morning, world. Nice and to then, see you, Mitch. Good morning, Peter. You know, How are you, Peter? We... Cleaner in the background there. It's nice, nice. Now, now Mitch, when <laughs> no. you vacuum, are you <laughs> vacuuming? You. Is that a lefty, lefty. vacuum? Yes, it's a lefty right. vacuum, and it only works on it only works on DC power. It only, <laughs> it's two twenty in honor of our guests. It's two twenty volts. Isn't it? Now, now, for everybody out there watching, I got to give a big thank you to Mitch Weissman because I've been up his ass. I go, I got to get Peter Noon. I got to get Peter Noon, and I'd write to Peter Noon like a crazy person. Peter Noon would not even write back to me, and I'm then I got. Everybody out there watching, I got so wrapped up into his Facebook, which you guys got to go out and check it out because Peter, does, he does a great thing. You'll see Peter working out. He'll he'll tell you in a nice way to screw off, but not like my way. But he's it's so much fun. So I recommend everybody go to his Facebook page and enjoy that. But Mitch. Mitch was you, a hermit, you know. You were a hermit. Yes, yes Mitch. He was a good hermit. Yes, you know what? We had a lot of laughs. We did a, We had a great time doing that. I mean, it's funny. When I first did the 2012 Happy Together tour, I sent out an email to people, and Peter actually wrote me back saying, "You forgot you were a hermit first before you were a monkey, before you were a turtle. You were a hermit." And it's, it's absolutely true. One of the best things I ever did with Peter was coming to visit him on Long Island at a live show, and he pulled me out on stage with him and Frank Nunziata and myself to do "If I Fell" and for. For the life of me, I wish someone would send me a picture of that. We did it. We did it with three-part harmony. It was amazing. Peter, we'll get it. We'll find it for you. We'll find it somewhere. It'll be fantastic. Yeah, Mitch, Mitch, you know what? You, much love, and and I'm so glad that you made this happen. And um, a other guest that's coming up here, he's just backstage. He's he's getting some props together. He wants to ask Peter a question. Mitch, <laughs> uh, you know this gentleman coming here, uh, producer, everybody, Ed Stasium, famous for doing those remote oh, records that you love. Ed, welcome to the show, Peter. Let me introduce you to producer Ed Stasium. Pleasure to meet you, Peter. Hi, oh, Eddie. Mitch, hello, That's Corey close. Miranda. Always a pleasure. Yeah, it's close. Always. Yeah. <laughs> Santa Claus is here, baby. <laughs> now we've got a party. That's right. My COVID beard. COVID. COVID beard. Hi, Uncle Eddie. <sighs> yes, okay. me, baby. Yeah. Oh, I have something to show you here. And then maybe Peter can tell us a little bit about this. I have to unfold it. I just happen to have this. Oh. Oh, 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 don't, don't rip it, Ed. Don't rip it. It could be worth money. It is worth money. Oh, darn. Yeah, that's a poster from a movie. Oh, wow. Yes. Good. It's big enough for you to hide behind. <laughs> I love it. Oh, my God. I got to get, I gotta get wow. Peter back on the show. Hold on. You've got a girl who really loves you. Wow. Wow. You. That great? That's great, Uncle Eddie. Isn't it great? It's a great poster. And I actually had um, the eight track of the soundtrack uh, wow. when I was a kid. I had the eight track in my parents' car. Wow. Yeah, the eight track of the soundtrack. Fabulous. Wow, wow that's great. I, I, Peter, Peter has the, I love humor. It's like mine. It's the think Yiddish, dress British. It's, it's the motto. Corey, you're fired. Peter, whenever you want, we're ready for you. I want to, Peter, is it, what's, Peter, I know, get rid of Corey. Peter, what's the Elvis story? I know you, I, I'm a huge Elvis guy. Love Elvis. And you had a story that you got to meet Elvis. Well, yeah, I did. It was, it, it's, I actually got to interview him. What happened when we were in Hawaii in the middle of a tour? And it's funny, in the, in the newspaper, years later, you discovered this stuff. I didn't even know. It's, it must be nice. Probably six years ago. I don't know. But so it says, Herman, 
from Herman's Hermits, meeting his all-time idol, Elvis Presley. Uh, Herman is in Herman's Hermits, who are on a 360-day world tour. Jeez. And on one of those days off, which was one, there were only five, we, we met <laughs> me and Barry Whitworth, stayed up all night so that we could go to meet Elvis before he started shooting his movie at 6 a.m. I don't know if you've ever been in a band, but <laughs> it's probably when you get home sometimes. <laughs> so we we stayed up all night in Hawaii drinking Mai Tais and oh, just, yeah. you know all that nonsense that they've got there. And uh, six, you know, five to six, we arrived at the Hawaiian village, and it's a real Hawaiian village with huts and made out of straw, whatever they make them from coconut leaves, and. We are punked by Elvis Presley. So we go into the, it was in the hut in there. We go in this hut and there's this guy lying face down, completely, it looks like he's been out with Keith Moon, dancing, flat. And, and it is Elvis. And oh God, and we don't know what to do, but they've, we're now in there. <laughs> what do we do? And then Elvis walks in and that is his, his double for the movie. Oh, it up. so his double, who looks exactly like him, is all crashed out, right? So he comes in, and I have to do an interview with him. And and unfortunately, uh, I'm I'm not good at interviews, so I didn't know that at the time. But I, I, <laughs> I, I, called, I called my sister in. My sister lived in Liverpool, and she knew everything about Elvis. So I said, "He won't believe this. I'm going to meet Elvis Presley." She was at work as well. I'm going to meet Elvis Presley. And I, I, I've got, what's a good question to ask him? And she says, ask him, does he dye his hair? No. <laughs> so I get into this interview. Uh, you do an interview, so you know now. Now all I'm doing, the whole interview, is I'm not thinking about anything, not listening to any of the questions. I'm looking at his hair all the time, you know, the hair. Look at that. Does he dye his Thinking, you know, I couldn't ever ask him that. So eventually I kind of... How come you made it without long hair? And he goes, sideburns. He was absolutely, <laughs> amazingly funny. All the things that you don't know about Elvis Presley were apparent. He had a great sense of humor. Unfortunately, he had a lot of men around him who laughed at everything he said. The same volume laugh. You know, some things you say are funnier than others, but each one of his jokes got the same volume of laughter. And, um, you know, like a laugh track, <laughs> but it, it was, he, he was great with us. Wow. I, you know, jokingly said, who's your favorite band? And he goes, oh, Beatles, Stones. Oh, and you guys, you know what I mean? Just, he was charming. And, and once again, you know, sort of all, all my heroes that I've met have, have always been disarmingly better than I expected them to be. You know, I remember having a cheeseburger and a, and a strawberry milkshake with Roy Orbison and stuff like that. You, Ooh, know, man. Just, you know, all the things that you wow. should eat with the triple bypass. But, you know, <laughs> I did things with Mitch Weissman there that I shouldn't do. But, hey, we're yeah. still alive. We're still fresh. <laughs> we're still fresh. And we're still here and we still talk to each other. Fantastic. <laughs> No, that's great, Mitch. I got to appreciate it for today's show and make uh, it happen. And Peter, I wish I know what I wish I'd been at Sammy Davis's apartment with you. That's all right. <laughs> you know what, Peter? You got so many stories. I hopefully, hopefully, I don't want to kill all your time. I want to ask more and more, but I want to, I want to respect your time. I got to have you come back for a part two. That the people here love you. I love you. Uh, I would love to have you. You know what? And everybody, please go check out his Facebook. Um, true legend true gentleman and you know what i was so nervous before i'm so glad i got to meet you you're a big part of my life man and you know what i think if it was for henry the eighth the ramones wouldn't have that verse right ed you took no, it right there, huh? no. and they right, but right. they said they said they said um you know um peter it was a uh second verse same as the first but with the ramones yeah. it was second verse uh no you peter said different than the first but the ramones said same as the first no I'm getting it all wrong. It's oh, wrong. just don't worry. You produced it. You're, come oh, on. That's it. You're, you're a legend I, producer. Got a legend singer. I'm I, I, yes, yes, Peter. Do you dye your hair? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's oh, nice, a, nice, the girls love it. Really the girls. Eddie, show us that. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs>
It's, he's he's ah. look at it. yeah. Let's show there. There you go. Very nice. Very nice. The yeah. chicks dig it, man. The, the chicks dig the it. Chicks I'm dig it. You know what? It's, I hope... it's uh, the girls uh, from Manic Panic. Christian uh, Tish and Snooky. Tish and Snooky yeah. on uh, St. Mark's yeah. Place. They had the yeah. store. Yeah, now they're worldwide, but it's a Manic Panic. Tish and Snooky, and it's a. Um, it's actually it's called uh, atomic turquoise. Yeah, we didn't even we didn't touch about the theater. What I, that, what I call that is something the drummer has to look at. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? That's like Mickey Dolan. Mickey Dolan's on those monkey store. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> that's true. That's true. God, we there's so much to go for a part two. I want to talk about Pete and Noons later on. We'll talk about a Casablanca's time on that. That's that's a rare one. You know, we have a vinyl show. I want, to talk about the, I want to talk about the tremblers. I want to talk about the tremblers. The tremblers were oh, fantastic. Yes. Yeah, so yeah we'll much. do that another time. We'll do it another, another time. When you guys aren't busy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know what? I, I go to back down <laughs> and pick up the crap. Hey, this guy. It's this good to meet you guys. Nice uh, to meet you. Oh, it's great to meet you. Thank you, Peter. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Adika Live. Wow. And thank you, Miranda, and you, Uncle Eddie. And thank what's you. his name? That Corey. <laughs> Corey. <laughs> what's his name is right. <laughs> On that note, he's got, he's got his head behind him. He's ready thank to go you. back to bed in a minute. Uh huh. <laughs> you yeah. haven't even uncovered him, <laughs> Corey. Oh, it's a, it's a story. <laughs> Peter, Peter, I'm going to tell you a quick story, really quick. That's that's because he lost his temper on Miranda's husband's a doctor, and we have on Friday we do a health and wellness show. But Corey cursed him out when he was my guest, first time. And my wife was friends of the doctor, so the whole weekend I thought it was a great show. I go, that was funny. Corey's shaking, his camera's going crazy. I thought it was good entertainment for YouTube. My it wasn't good entertainment for my marriage. My wife was so mad at me. But long story short, they became regulars on the show. I had to find a way to kiss everybody's ass. But anyway, legends. <laughs> legends. But on that note, we're a wacky bunch. Peter, you are a legend. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Really thank you. To have you. For me on Much the show. love to you. Okay. Much thank love. You, Peter. Everybody out there love watching, Muriel. we will see you later. Everybody, see you later. subscribe, click, see you and see share. You, see you, mm. Bye, everybody. Cheers. It's coffee time. Oh, and don't forget to click on that and click over there and click over there, over there, and subscribe, share, like it. Tell a friend. It's a good time. We love you. Have a good day.